Yeah. Uh, so since I cannot see you, I will just uh, tell you certain things about Mav. Uh, 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 she doesn't need introduction yet. I'm going to do that because this is a formal class. Professor Shanjul Dasgupta is the prof professor and former head department of English, Dean Faculty of Arts, University of Calcutta, is a critic, translator, poet, and a teacher above everything else. Uh, currently, she's the convener of Sahitya Academy. She has published in journals in India and abroad. Her awards and grants include British Council Charles Wallace Scholar Grant, Fulbright Postdoctoral Research Fellowship, Fellowship Associate Fellow at Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla. She participated in the, in the Writers and Literary Translators International Congress at Stockholm and also served as chairperson for Commonwealth Writers uh, Prize organized by the Common Commonwealth Foundation UK. And uh, as many of you are aware of it, I had read uh, parts of uh, poems from Lakshmi Unbound in class while we were discussing gender. So it is written by her, as you know, and uh, from that, she doesn't need any introduction to you. Today, she'll be discussing about migration and border studies, which we have in uh, our PhD course for syllabus. This is mainly for PhD scholars, but we have invited other uh, postgraduate students uh, because uh, if, if they want to pursue this in their future endeavor, I'm sure they'll be benefited by this. We have a scholar who is uh, taking up Caribbean diaspora studies. So he's studying Carol Phillips, Judy Alvarez, and uh, I'm sure we all are looking forward to for your lecture. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you. Uh, ma'am, uh, did you say border studies or did you say uh, just a small yeah, technicality, ma'am? Uh, okay. spotlight could shift. That's all right, ma'am. Uh, which means your uh, your screen will be sort of bigger than the others. If that's okay, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, ma'am. Sorry. Migration and diaspora. Sorry, migration uh, and diaspora studies, ma'am. Okay, okay. It contributes. Yeah. yeah. The study. Spotlight, <laughs> but narcissistic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, okay. So, can I start? Yes, ma'am. Please. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma please, right. ma 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 Can I just, uh, just, uh, just one for for a minute? I can intervene, ma'am. Oh, Dr. Anupurna please, Mukherjee. Uh, please uh, enable the participant screen sharing, please. Oh, okay, sure, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I'll do that. Um, yes. I, I can. Uh, because I am ambitious sure, sure, about sure. getting a um, PowerPoint. Presentation. Ma'am, I think you should be able to do so now. If if you try it now, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay. Ma'am, uh, may Have I just one it? more time in between? Have you enabled it? I think so, ma'am. I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, I'm on their faculty. Can you see? Ase, can, I... can you see something? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. 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 Yes, so you don't know how I practiced to get this um, PPT ready for all of you and I switched it on and off 200 times so that today it would make some sort of a funny reluctance to come on. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. It's so wonderful to be able to meet students and teachers and teachers who were students once upon a time. And it's a moment of great pleasure for a teacher to be able to share one's understanding of particular areas. Since uh, the area that was sent to me as a formal letter was migration and diaspora studies, I kept the little uh, frame. Now, migration really is not my area because it's really complex. My area has been diaspora stated migration and diaspora studies, I will start with my, as you know, these are very uh, well-known terms, especially for those who are already working on, in these areas. But I think we need this uh, introduction in terms of a frame through which we can approach this. Lately, of course, we have been hearing about 
the tragic plight of the migrant workers. So there are many ca categories of migrants. That is what we need to understand first. And all moving out of one place to the another, uh, to another, very loosely we can term it as migration. Now let's proceed a little further than this. This, as you see, migration happens for a uh, range of reasons. These can be economic, social, political, or environment. So when we go to human migration, because animals migrate also, yes? So human migration is the movement of people from one place in the world to another. But the patterns of migration, the conditions of a changing world and impact, the cultural landscapes of both the places, people leave and the places they settle. To leave a place, especially for Asians, as you know, is about a sort of severe social and cultural uprooting. This uprooting and rerouting is something that can be quite traumatic for an individual and also for a collective group. Here again, this problem of uprooting becomes a part of collectivist culture that is like culture than maybe the individualistic cultures of the first world, where the problem of uprooting and rerouting, you do not see so many troubled texts as we find in the Asian texts. Asia here means also Southeast Asia, yes? So Japanese, Vietnamese, uh, Chinese uh, texts also which deal with the diaspora. Now, of the types of migration, these are all available on Google, but even then, if you want to take a picture or, or if you want to just make a note, these are important because sometimes, you know, very loosely we say migration, but we are not really thinking about all the complexities that even the term involves. Yes, the migration as a signifier. So internal migration, external migration, emigration. And the subtle but distinct difference between emigration and immigration. And the return migration, moving back to where you came from. You will remember that uh, Jhumpa Lahiri's uh, latest um, book of short stories, Unaccustomed Earth. There you find that there is a desire to return. That desire to return is what the very latest diasporic texts are uh, trying to showcase. And seasonal migration, moving with each season or in response to labor or climate conditions, mostly applicable to rural migration. Now, because after all, you're students of literature and not social sciences, I thought that you might find this poem by Bertolt Brecht very interesting. Can you see it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. If you are not, let can I read it a little? Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah. So, uh, I always thought the name they gave, gave us was wrong, emigrants. Now, Bresch, as you know, had a very tough time because he was uh, considered to be a leftist, if not a member of the Communist Party, which he denied. And uh, he had to move from place to place. He was a German. And then he had to move from pla one place to the other in Europe. And ultimately, he landed up, I think, in 1941 in uh, the U.S. And in the USA, they were calling him an immigrant and asking him to conform, asking him to change, as in the case of us. So, immigrants. After all, that means people who voluntarily move out. But we did not live like that of our own free will, choosing another country. So voluntarily move out. Our migrant laborers who are out in the street, do you think they are really voluntarily moving out? The day there was a lockdown, they were told, now you will not get on-site accommodation. You will not get any sort of help, no salary, no electricity, no water. You understand? 
So the plight of migrants of this level who have been forced into migration is very different from voluntary migration. Yes? So choosing another country, choosing another country, uh, most young people start to think that as they go into higher studies that my promised land is the US. Yes. So, and, uh, and the parents also nurture that dream. Uh, it doesn't just happen to them because the parents have a dream that I couldn't reach America, so my kids must. So, but we are not looking at, at that sort of migration right now. Neither did we move to a land so as to stay there possibly forever. Instead, we fled. We are driven out, banished, and the land that took us in will be a place of exile, not a home. Yes? So whether it is forced migration or voluntary migration, the search for a home, a house is often not a home. Yes? So that feeling at home is crucial for individuals because despite all this talk about social distancing, we know that human beings are social by nature. Yes, we will not talk about the misanthropists at least. Okay? And the land that took us in will be a place of exile, not a home. Restless, we stay there as close as possible to the frontiers, awaiting the day of return, observing the least change beyond the border, eagerly questioning every new arrival, forgetting nothing, see, forgetting nothing, memory, nostalgia, rootedness, trauma, are all stated in that one line. Forgetting nothing and giving up nothing. And also not forgetting anything that happened, forgiving nothing. Ah, the silence of the sound, silence of the sound, that's of course the poet, does not deceive us. We hear the cries from their camps all the way here. After all, we ourselves are almost like rumors of evil deeds which escaped over the frontiers. Each one of us who with torn shoes moves through the crowd testifies to the shame that now defiles our land. But none of us will remain here. The last word has not yet been spoken. So when I discovered this poem by Bresh, I thought it was very appropriate and I was eager to share it with you. So now we move on to the modes of migration. Permanent migration, temporary migration for a limited period of time, which is seasonal employment, and forced migration, as you found in the case of Bresh. So internal migration reasons can be inter-regional and intra-regional. -re Even if we hadn't known about all this, what is happening in India right now, we are very aware. Yes, we knew about Probashi Bangali who went off to places like North India to settle there during the colonial times. But in this case, it is absolutely the working class casual laborers who are not listed in the labor registers, which is called the unorganized sector, that it is these people who seem to be traveling from one state to the other in search of livelihood. The main type has been from rural to urban areas in search of jobs. And as you know, all of you have domestic workers at home who are not working right now and you are working, but nevertheless, so these are the ones whose histories are the, uh, are the central discourse of internal migration, yes? Two major types of migration are internal and international, which I have already touched on. There is another migration about which I will not talk about right now, uh, today rather, uh, because it's a gender issue. But I thought, as I profess, to be a feminist that I should not do this one. So marriage migration is 70% women of India have to migrate because of marriage. Yes, very few have that sense of uh, willpower to not vacate their country because 
they would be able to run their own lives themselves and would not follow the husband to his place of work. So we will not go into all those com uh, uh, complex issues, but please remember that marriage migration is a huge area which is often overlooked. Internal migration, what you are seeing every day on television and even in the newspapers, if they are, uh, if you're receiving them and notice this picture because I think it's very, very chilling really. Look at the partition of India and look at the earlier one. Yes, this is what forced migration. These are really, uh, we use a new term there. We don't call them migrants. We will call them refugees. Refugees. Mm. Mm. Because they're moving from one country to the other. Suddenly there was that split up. India, undivided India became India and Pakistan on both sides, East Pakistan and West Pakistan. So these people who were part of the land suddenly become refugees. Seeking refuge. Yes. And refugees, again, can be you know, split into another particular category, which is a very uh, micro category that's called asylum seekers. When refugees do not come in a procession, but suddenly one person makes an entry into another country. Those are complex things, yes? Here the refugees are coming in, as you see, partition of India, 1947. And 2020, this is what we are seeing. What is the change? Let's go to the... Now, let us look at some of the... No, uh, 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 concepts regarding refugees uh, and the, how they are being described. I will just look at the 1951 Refugee Convention where uh, it ha refugees have been defined as someone who is unable and unwilling to return to their country of origin owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political people. Mm. The trauma of partition, remember the migrants that we saw? And look at the Syrian refugees. It's the same thing. Mm. Look at this, 2017 onwards, all of them trying to move into Bangladesh because these Rohingyas are Muslims. Okay, mm. so they found but uh, thankfully Bangladesh did not turn them out. Now when we look at Indians abroad and voluntary migration we are looking at an entirely different issue. Here it is not indentured labor which is not part of this presentation today because indentured labor is a very different category. But when we are looking at Indians abroad, do you remember a term that uh, you probably heard from, because you are terribly young, it must be from your grandparents, about the Bilet Ferot Jamat. Mm. Yes, yes. But uh -huh. now you know about the Bilet Thaka Jamat. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody likes a Bilet Ferot Jamat. Why, why did it happen? 1961, the Immigration Act and Naturalization Act that was signed because the West suddenly found that they needed skilled labor, high skilled labor. And because of the two world wars, they're always mad about wars, as you know, because uh, they produce the greatest weapons in the world. And they also have to find a market, which is why they keep wars alive in the third world. So they found that the way in which they could run their economy, the GDP being very strong, to make it very strong, they had to invite skilled labor. And what better strategy than to invite people from all over the world, which means the developing countries. At that time, around 1961, Till globalization, you did 
did not have too many European skilled labor moving to Western, uh, the first world countries. But what that is, mostly the th three targets are generally the UK, the United States, Canada, Australia, and also ran, end up in the Caribbean, the Fiji and things, yes? So it's very glamorized, the idea of reaching that place. And you will find that even if you meet a Polish person, the target of that person is to reach the US. Yes. So culturally, socially, economically, and also politically, there is this constant flow of skilled labor into these promised lands starting with us moving on to canada and then spreading through europe so let us go on to the next slide and as i i'm just once again repeating this slide to remind you of the types of migration and when it is voluntary migration what are what is somebody looking for you will find that people say, oh, the labs in Harvard are the best. Yes, but that is not the only reason. Better living conditions, access to health care, access to better education. And in terms of being a little anecdotal, a young scientist in New York State said that, well, oh, so that's the difference. Yes. So better living conditions, better employment prospects, higher wages. These are the compelling factors which uh, sort of direct people to move out of their native land where they have been born to uh, these locations which promise a better life. The quality of living becomes much better political factors, a certain type of political system, a certain politician or policies that I am not too sure how tenable is that argument. And the negatives, what are the negatives? The host country, that is say America or the UK, how would they, you know, their immigration laws have become very, very harsh now. And so the negatives are, Healthcare, education, welfare, housing to people, large diversity can lead to racial tensions. And racial tensions is something that all of you, many of you have traveled in to various parts of the world and you know racism is very much alive there. Yes, though we talk about human rights and on the land where human rights really began as a formal system, their human rights is abused and people often feel that sense of being not wanted so and what are the positives also for those countries more diversity which is why you will find that if you are a fulbright applicant the word diversity becomes very important yes cultural understanding diversity and inclusiveness those are the ideal conditions the uh, positive uh, parts are new trades, new skills, cheaper workforce is what the host country derives from this sort of exodus of skilled labor into first world countries. So demand for skilled labor, as I said, the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965. Now that is very important and uh, you can just look it up in terms of how uh, populations have settled or uh, settled in these countries and from countries in Asia, Africa and Latin America as opposed to Europe. Yes, Europe probably becomes one uh, particular uh, entrant in this field post globalization that is from 1991 onwards then you can also find an illegal immigrant or an immigrant without any sort of uh, transparent uh, paper, paper. Yeah. 
papers available to her to be working in people's homes. Yes, which is why now in the USA and in many other first world countries, you find a lot of domestic laborers who work part time, which was not the case before 1991. That is Europeans, East Europeans working in American homes as domestic labor. Okay. Asian immigrants in the world. So the US Asian population grew 72% between 2000 and 2015, according to the statistics available. So the largest pool comes from India, the Philippines and China, as their migrants are on average more educated. And the advantage of India is of course, the English language. Yes, hmm. so we just love linguistic imperialism because it helps us a lot. Yes. So immigrants by choice. You don't travel like those migrant workers in torn shoes without food. But there you are in that uh, jet plane migration, which is migration by choice, voluntary migration. And then your dream is to be on the cover of Forbes. Why not? Yes. So, so that is how it is. But then we are looking at also another category, the flow of illegal migrants. Yes. You know, of lately we were really, uh, there was, we erupted about issues like uh, the in our NRP and the CAA and others. Yes, it is about illegal migration. The flow of illegal migrants is often from poorer countries to richer countries. Hmm. The people involved often are not the poorest in their home country. They tend to be people with a lot of information, knowledge, ambition, and motivation, which often fuels their desire to migrate for a better life. Now, the asylum seekers, however, among the illegal migrants, do not travel all together, but they travel individually. So one of you, uh, I think, is working on on, uh, on the novels of Carol Phillips. Yes, ma'am. Phillips has a novel called The Distant Shore, yes, and which got the which received uh, which was awarded the. Commonwealth Writers' Prize. Now, this particular novel is a novel about an asylum seeker from Africa who gets into a van, arrives in the UK, settles in a rural country, a rural part of the UK, of England, and his sort of inability to be part of that social environment. It's a very chilling, very disturbing narrative. And since you're working on Carol Phillips, as you know, he uh, probably was the chair of the Migration Studies <laughs> Department <laughs> of, um, of Columbia University. Columbia. Was. Is he still continuing there? Do you know? Not very sure, but yeah, he was. He yeah. was the head there. Yeah. He, he had, he has done a lot of work in this area, mm -hmm. along with Jamaica Kincaid, uh, Andrea mm -hmm. Levy. But uh, the difference between Carol Phillips and Jamaica Kincaid and uh, Andrea Levy is that they, uh, the women writers in the di the diasporic women writers generally talk about the micro politics of daily living, that is about home, about running a home, about the children. But uh, it's very interesting. But uh, in terms of this gender divide, uh, in terms of uh, the diaspora writers, whereas uh, the men generally choose to be uh, choose a much more um, macro political uh, scenario to explore and experiment, and that's really really very interesting. Experiment in terms of representation in order to deconstruct the dream of the promised land. Yes, so undocumented immigrants, these are people who live in a place without permission. So you have to be in constant hiding in some way or the other because you're not listed at all in the payrolls of any company. 
So it is very difficult for a person uh, not to be uh, not to be jailed or not to be uh, challenged and even uh, sent back. So and there is a method which doesn't say very well about Asians, but most many Asian students have been known to join universities and then slowly fade away. Mm. You understand whether it's the UK or the USA, they join a particular mm. university and slowly they, are, they have dropped out of class and then nobody knows where they are. Okay. Yes. And the advantage is, uh, advantage for Asians is because of our collectivist culture, there's a chacha or a mama or somebody <laughs> who is constantly helping them. And so they are really able to stay there, especially this is very, very true of uh, Indians from, uh, uh, in terms of the North Indians and also the South Indians. Yes, they have made it almost a uh, sort of an art, this <laughs> moving from one place to the other and not being located, not being detected unless they have taken bank loans and then the bouncers get them up uh, in those countries. So, you know, it's a little complex, but undocumented immigrants also should be part of the discourse, especially because of the distant shore and Carol Phillips. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Illegal migration. And, you know, in the US, especially, uh, these people are getting off the boat. I uh, deliberately Karen chose this pat yes. particular um, image. And the reason is that in the US, if they hear that you are a new migrant, oh, she's she's fresh off the boat, which means yeah. that you just don't know what to do. Yes, fresh oh, off the boat. Yes, and so yeah. fresh off the boat category uh, people are not very well respected by their Asian counterparts in first world countries who I sort know. of try to ignore them. And that impassive face, it's not even Mona Lisa. There is a little bit of a hint of a 5% smile there, which led to all that enigma about Mona Lisa. Yes, but this is an ex uh, absolutely sphinx-like face with which the ones who are settled, Asians settled in those countries, would lo look upon those who have just arrived. This again, you you know, a discussion is very interesting in terms of the assimilation within the culture. Yes, mm. to accommodate, to assimilate, mm. these are some of the required mm. modes in which one can settle from the home country into the host mm. country. So look at these illegal uh, immigrants illegal migration and remember all those earlier pictures again about migration that we noticed mm -hmm. so before 1947 when there was these bilet ferot jamais yeah so my uh, was one of them i'm told so <laughs> so anyway so flow of migrants from india before 1947 the places that they would go to now Flow of South Asian migrants after 1947. See the complex. They can just about go anywhere. They can settle in Fiji also, but they might not be terribly interested in settling in the lower Limpopo Valley. Yes. So that may be the difference. But all the destinations are towards the first world countries. And so I'll look at this um, Mira Sahel, I don't know whether you're familiar with her, uh, with her work. She is a UK based uh, Indian writer, Indian, uh, British Indian, which is, uh, who are all categorized together as black Indian, uh, in the black British writers. So look at this very important statement that she made. just learned very early on that those of us deprived of history sometimes need to return to mythology to feel complete, to belong. 
Now to the migrants who have settled in these countries, that is the diaspora community, are very serious about maintaining uh, their own culture within their homes. You cannot do it outside your home, yes? So the home within is India. Open the door and the home outside is, is the United States or the UK, any part of Europe. So th there is constantly this sort of uh, a paradox in terms of mostly the children. Again, let me be anecdotal. A child returns in the USA from a school and tells her mom, uh, that she's very uncomfortable because the white children do not seem to uh, uh, want to associate with her. And then during the weekend, she tells her mother, I tried so hard to rub off my skin to see whether the white part would come out. Can you imagine? So how traumatic it yeah. is for the yeah. child yeah. that she is yeah. not part of it all. So parents... Uh, generally try to choose a school where there is a um, mixed ethnic group rather than an all-white school, if possible. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the complexities and so mythology. So, in terms of the epics, which are greatly revered, as you know, and of course, uh, the religious um, practices and temples, the institution of religion is very, very strong yes. among the Asian diaspora. Yes. yes, more than out mm. here. And one reason for that, that is a sort of a communitarian spirit that is generated mm. through these uh, visits to temples and yes. the uh, religious uh, rich that one follows. Because naturally, if you go to the US, you cannot uh, start at you know, Congress party only. Yes, it is not possible. You cannot go into politics at all unless you are ambitious. If you get an American citizenship and you want to be part of the American uh, Republican or Democratic um, parties. But you can't say I'll start a, uh, start a Trinamool Congress or I'll start something like an Indian National Congress out here. Yes, an extension of that. It's not possible. And that would be very fearful. You might even uh, have to leave the country. But religion is a safe haven. It's a safe choice. And so people felt deeply rooted that, that sense of communitarianism became so much a part of their lives. And so it was uh, uh, religion plays a huge role in the lives of the Asian diaspora, especially South Asia. And then look at what is Nehru saying. Nehru is the re returning Yes, so the billet peril. So I have become a queer mixture of the East and West, out of place everywhere, at home nowhere. They are both part of me. I'm a stranger and alien in the West. I cannot be of it, but in my own country also sometimes, I have an exiles feeling, the feeling of the cosmopolitan. Yes, in terms of, especially when we are looking at these categories of literature probably illustrates this best in terms of that perpetual war between Desi literature and, yes, Indian English literature is pan-Indian and also global. Mm. Desi literature, mm. unless translated, remains rooted to its own particular location or state. And so this feeling of the cosmopolitan, which is the expected feeling of uh, those who write uh, in English, uh, creative narratives and also creative nonfiction, is their understanding of the world is a little different from those who write in regional languages. But we will not go into those complexities again, but you should keep this in mind. And so what did Said say? He was from Palestine. And he said, I occasionally experience myself as a cluster of flowing currents. I prefer this to the idea of a solid self, 
the identity with, to which so many attach so much significance. Sides had taught in that same university where Carol Phillips is probably teaching now, where Spivak is teaching, that is the Columbia University in New York. Yes. And so out of place, that's his memoir, where he's talking about place, that yeah. sense of fluidity, which is so much a part of the diasporic self's dilemma of location, relocation, and also the feeling of uprooting. Hmm. So finally, we come to some, uh, and then Vasanji, which part from M.G. Vasanji is from Canada. And so for a white person, how would a person like Vasanji appear? He says, I'm Indian and African and all screwed up with Western education. And all she sees that is a white woman is that I am third world. Yes? Third world. <laughs> so third world. And third world means, well, it's a very demeaning category. And so, as you know, un unfortunately, I don't think I should um, uh, keep this off record. Even the people who are dying of COVID-19, if you mm. see the demographic split, you will uh, understand who are the ones who are the victims. It's so, so, I mean, in terms of bulk. If you just look up the worldometer, you can see those split up. But, so, and this is a special favorite of mine in terms of multiple identities. What Amartya Sen says, that these identities, you can be Asian, Indian citizen, a Bengali with Bangladeshi ancestry, an American, a British resident, an economist, a dabbler in philosophy, an author, a Sanskritist, a strong believer in secularism and democracy, a man, a feminist, mm. a heterosexual, mm. a defender of gay and lesbian rights. So all these, this would be contradicted, mm. but they are not. They can all be part of the composite individual with a non-religious lifestyle from a Hindu background, a non-Brahmin and a non-believer in afterlife. Okay. Mm. So, and then, of course, for those who, uh, these are the very well-known uh, definitions of hybridity and mimicry, because once you move out of your own cultural terrain and reroute in a different culture, there is this element of hybridity. There is the element of mimicry. Mimicry was also part of our colonial experience when uh, the, uh, because of being colonized, because of cultural colonization, those who imagined they had achieved a lot, uh, they needed to achieve a lot, were very proud of absolutely imitating the colonizer, culturally and socially. Which again, if you, uh, in terms of a metaphor, they were often described derisively as coconuts, brown outside, mm. white inside. What even Macaulay talked about, yes, that you have to be English in, in your feelings, English in your dreams. That's the only way. Just uh, mouthing the English language was just not enough. Yes. Mm. Uh, reason why often in English medium schools, I do not know right now whether they use that expression, but in, when we study, they would always ask us to memorize those poems by heart. By heart. Mm -hmm. Yes? So, mm -hmm. you know, it's your entire involvement. It's not just an intellectual in involvement, which Franz Fano in The Return of the Earth yes. had pointed out. Yes, about this, this sort of domination of the mind, the control of the mind. Mm. So hybridity, and I think we are almost coming to a close of this. I, I'm sure there will be a, a few questions from you. Mm. And so liminality and ambivalence. In India, we have a wonderful uh, diasporic critic who uh, talks about liminality and ambivalence and uses the uh, mythic uh, figure Trishonku, 
Trishunku, who doesn't belong to any part, but is a sort of suspended in midair. Yes, because that longing and belonging, longing to belong, and the sort of need to be rooted is not so easily possible. Yes, though right now there is a lot of hype and rhetoric about being transnational and transcultural. Uh, since globalization, that is. It's a concept of the third space, as you know. I'm just rushing to this. So what happens if you're transcultural? She's as English as daffodils or chicken tikka masala. Yes. And you know about the Balti chicken. <laughs> and how Balti chicken became so popular. It's all because somebody misinterpreted that in the ethnic dictionary. Or that a bowl was a Balti. <laughs> But the Indian Balti, the real ones, the metallic ones, are really embarrassing. You know, but we would not. <laughs> All right. So, return of the native, the re-migration, which again we are noticing, which I referred to as we began this talk. So, your parents had decided to leave Cambridge, not for Atlanta or Arizona, as some other Bengalis had, but to move all the to leave Cambridge. This is Cambridge in the USA, yes? To move all the way back to India, abandoning the struggle that my parents and their friends embarked on. So instead of staying there, the racism is so strong, even in 2020, that there is an urge to relocate now that we have some material facilities which would not be very upsetting for those who want to relocate back to their place of origin, the native land. And so now we are looking at transnationalism. That is just wonderful. But look at that. We talk about the local. Look at the hand holding. The white is. It's not really a hand-holding, which it's you needing. find that there is not a racial equality over there, if you see mm -hmm. properly. And so, in terms of that hand-holding also, of course, it is a positive step. And we are thinking in terms of transnationalism. But whenever we use the term global, we are 70% glo global and 30% local. And that is where, again, the conflict begins. And now the most important slide of all. <laughs> so I will stop this. If you have questions, just feel free to ask. I have kept you for a very long time. Okay, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, Yes, Indira. Sorry. Yeah, she's a uh, faculty ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. Uh, I um, uh, I'm late to the uh, this thing. Um, actually, uh, I have just a query, and I was wondering. Uh, I was going through uh, one of the texts by Behruz Bukhani, who uh, he's uh, an asylum seeker, as you were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, he is a Kurdish Iranian who had to uh, who was forced. Uh, who was into forced migration a few years back and uh, he was detained for some of citizenship laws in Australia mm -hmm. and uh, he, he as you were talking about this migration individual migrations mm -hmm. I think he was also driven out from his country uh, from Kurdistan mm -hmm. and um, he he was uh, he's currently a writer and his journalist by profession but then he had to sort of leave his uh, home country and then uh, you know by various means he had to escape uh, international laws and then finally landed in Australia uh, I think a few years back around in 2013 or 14 but uh, maybe because of complex citizenship laws in Australia uh, many of them who were like the, like the way they term boat people so um, I was just trying to understand I'm just I'm very naive and I'm, it might be a very naive question actually just trying to understand how we place these kind of uh, migrants. I mean, uh, 
uh, can you please enlighten me on this? I'm still in a very uh, naive state. We were talking about illegal migrants. We were talking yes, about asylum seekers. Uh, and both illegal migrants and asylum seekers because these people, like I'm talking about Behrouz Bukhani. So uh, he has got one book. It's a very interesting book I was reading. It's actually an account of... Um, his own experiences in a detention camp, uh, which is in Manus Island in Australia, mm -hmm. and with inhuman conditions of stay there, he somehow mm -hmm. managed to retain a mobile phone. I don't know how, uh, because of the stricter uh, security checks. And apparently, this man has written his account, not only his own account, also experiences of his fellow uh, inmates in the, uh, I would say jail, of course, it's a jail, it's a kind of a detention camp. Mm -hmm. So he had mm -hmm. uh, sort of... Uh, you know, kept that and he uh, managed to write about his account uh, through WhatsApp. I mean, that's a very okay. different way of communication. Oh. It's a very interesting uh, book I was reading. So mm -hmm. I was trying to locate how do but we... Is he being persecuted in Australia by the immigrant uh, Uh Ma'am, uh, currently I think, um, I think he is free. Currently he is free, but um, there, have, there have been accounts of uh, his like torture and his, his stay was from 2014 around 2017, 16, 17. So oh, okay. I'm not very, uh, very confident about what he is right, doing right now, but I think he is free. But I, I just read Australia his is one of the more racist um, uh, places in the world because, as you know, about the white Australian policy up to the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And then again, when they opened up again, uh, because they wanted skilled labor, because of the Immigration Act, etc. So when they were very, very selective about the people they would allow into their own country, and they chose to allow more Southeast Asians, which is why you will find that there are more people from China, Japan, Vietnam, and Korea in uh, Australia than Asians up to a particular time from 19 uh, from the 1980s 1990s slowly asians started settling there so again iran is a country which will not be very well um, recognized or received for political reasons by australia because australia is guided by the coalition of the willing as as you know the UK, the US, Canada, etc. And whatever uh, sort of have been their political agenda has been part of Australia almost follow suit. Yes, something there is something very mimetic about Australia's foreign policy. Yes, because it uh, keeps on following whatever these other countries have been doing. Though Australia could have had a much more independent approach, but even as you know, they also participated in the First World War. There was this tremendous massacre. And so Australian history is one where there has been always a support for the First World countries. Now, the first world country de-recognize people as asylum seekers from particular locations which are not within the categories of being safe migrants. Then, of course, the person, as you said, he was jailed, he was persecuted, he was tortured. That is very possible. But these are isolated uh, uh, sort of uh, experiences of relocation. And... Uh, his, his particular experience, as you are describing, is a very mixed one because he was forced out of his own country and then in the country where he chose to relocate, again he was tortured. So, you know, that feeling of not being wanted is always related to your particular uh, ethnic um, identity in terms of religion, in terms of uh, race, in terms of the person, whether male or female, all that contributes to uh, the person. And here, I suppose, he was able to break free because he could write, because yes. he was literate. He was not only li literate, but he was so sophisticated that he knew how to use a smartphone, 
he could reach the world through his WhatsApp narratives, his blogs or whatever. And so that is a, again a position of privilege which many migrants who you saw traveling in those boats probably don't know the language. One of the greatest demands in the UK is that the person who, person who wants to relocate in the United Kingdom must know English. That is working knowledge. Ayers. You don't have to really sorry, read uh, Evolve, but whatever. I'm sorry, I'm Ayers, just interrupting yes. here. Uh, my, I think my impression is also incomplete in that sense. Uh, talking about language because uh, the person I'm talking about he was uh, writing in his own uh, language some okay, okay. Kurdish language and that was later translated he was sending these uh, messages to uh, some of his uh, one, one friend and he happens to be an academic in Australian University and he with his help he could uh, publish this book mm -hmm. translated by that man so uh, I mean I think okay so uh, it's not that but then he was lucky to get himself translated once again, that is the global language has rescued him. Yes. yes, like the slave narratives in America were also ones probably which were not written in English and uh, not written in free flowing English. But there is a perception that maybe some of the white people would take up their stories and uh, especially during the Civil War, uh, in the mid 19th century, well, where the Yankees and the Southerners were having a fight. And that was the Civil War was not only about um, the rights of Black Americans, it was also about a lot of uh, landed property and the new generation uh, capitalists. Yes. Indira. Yes, ma'am. My name is Indira. Yeah. Sorry. Good area. Uh, address to the scholars. Do you have any observations, uh, questions to ask, ma'am? Can I ask? I a have question? a question. Oh, yeah, please, oh, please. Yeah. After you, ma'am. After you. After you. No, no. Please go ahead. I, I can ask. Oh, Onuparna. Yes, Onuparna. Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I'm Oluporna. So uh, thank you for such a lovely lecture. So, I was just wondering, ma'am, you've covered uh, so many things. I mean, I mean a, a range of emotions from nostalgia to uh, trauma uh, to, you know, um, suspicion, guilt. So I was just wondering, I mean, with the affective turn in literature, and in migration studies. I mean, what is the role, if you could kind of tell us a little more about the role of affect in uh, uh, you know, micro life trajectories, if I may put it. Um, yeah, I mean, because we don't talk about affect all the time nowadays. Yeah, I know. Uh, I think, you know, in women's writing, especially in migra uh, migrant literature, in women's writing, affect seems to be the absolute target of those narratives. Yes. And so the emotional intelligence and empathy and a lack of empathy and also interrogating sympathy are part of the discourse of women writers. That is the way I would look at uh, the migrant literature available uh, around the world. Whereas if you look at, uh, if you consider Roshdi to be a diaspora writer, does he write about what you are trying to describe uh, as affect? Does uh, Amitabh Ghosh write that way? Or Rohindran Mistri? Or Vasanji, whom we just referred to? So their approach is different. Not that, that it lacks effect, but the sort of um, central discourse of women's diasporic writing and women's migrant literature is one which I think is replete with various illustrations of affect in its various categories. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm um, sorry, I'm uh, just uh, asking one more question, uh, not related to the earlier one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a question related to your one of your PPTs. When you're talking about uh, uh, Sri Shanku, a, a person who is really, um, who, who writes That's about Sri Shanku experiences, mm -hmm. are you talking about Devdar Patnak? No. 
no tabhi tha abhi hai is not what i'm talking okay. so, so, so i, I was trying to know that no trishom ko is that liminal state the state of ambivalence the third space when there is a sense of not belonging and this constant dilemma of trying to belong <laughs> yes so that's uh, devdat patnaik is not somebody who i would uh, relate to ethnic i mean um, yeah uh, rather that's for him yes because uh, he has a different agenda a different uh, way of thinking and for that we need to meet again and where <laughs> you might tell me about your experience of this new school of writing sarav you had a question for ma'am yes ma'am you know something yes yes, yes. hello ma'am i'm sure uh, i'll i'll be working on caril philips and uh, caribbean migration and diaspora um, i had a question a very fundamental question again a very naive question but it has it has time and again bothered me uh, william safran uh, has been of the opinion that in order to call a community a diaspora uh, there has to be uh, a desire or to return to the homeland or an affinity towards the homeland but uh, does this not uh, uh, in case of voluntary uh, uh, migration where i am leaving my uh, strong center to go to a weak periphery in case uh, for to carve out a better living for myself and uh, so does this not problematize the angst so if i if i go to the uh, uh, to, to to some other place hmm. and then i uh, if i say uh, well my land was so good i would want to go back to my land does uh, is there any uh, honesty in that angst can can that be considered to be a diaspora can that angst be uh, you know can it be validated in case of uh, forced migrations or things like that where you do not have a choice you are put on a ship sent to a far away land and you do not like it there and you want to come back home and that is why you hold on to everything of home but in case you leave willingly and then you say i want to come back home or i want to hold on to home well uh, you knew the consequences so does that become a factor it's 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 again a very naive question but it's always kind of uh, bothered me now uh, you see again in terms of migration there are uh, several levels the first generation migrant is called a new migrant the second generation migrant is the offspring of the new migrant yes the children those children yes, are not really indian they are british passport holders american passport holders french passport holders and for them india is a tourist site do you understand so the dilemma is yes, with the first yes, generation migrant the new migrant who as you uh, have read in jhumpa lahiri's name say at least yes and in also the novels of bharati mm -hmm. ji in chitra banerji divakar in india mm -hmm. earlier ones now of course she has uh, turned to indian myths big time obviously uh, with the sort of environment we are in now but what we notice is that uh, the fact that the first generation migrants are not at all comfortable so because it's uh, for them it's a shock to their system but i think from 1991 one onwards uh, post uh, global from globalization onwards there has been a tremendous change in our culture whether for good or bad time will tell where children speak in english with their parents where uh, anything other than english is looked upon as something uh, in terms of language is something that is considered to be home language where your identity is one uh, where mm, somehow you are uh, almost like a resident non indian yes and so and that is again in locations of privilege 
the class factor becomes very important here. Yes, not like the boy who said, I used to eat moody and now I can eat sausage. That's a different category. Yes, but <clears throat> in terms of holding on, wanting to hold on to one's own particular culture will come to the new migrants all the time. But the second and third generations are ones who are tourists in their own place of origin. PIO as they're called, yes? Um, if Thank I may you. sort of, uh, sure of actually, if I may intervene yeah. here, I think it's um, uh, because, and, and here I'll sort of speak again from my own experience to some extent because I was doing my PhD in uh, in Northern Ireland, in, in mm. the UK. And sure of actually, this, this point that you mentioned we about. a lot of anecdotes, yeah. <laughs> I do. And, you know, I actually I keenly experienced this process that Shorab is uh, talking about and this, uh, you know, your home country and, uh, you know, your home culture as a kind of baggage because one of the things that I felt you know I wasn't ever planning to settle but uh, mm -hmm. wanting to feel like you belong to this new space where you're kind of absorbing a new culture and where you want to feel like you're just anyone else uh, you know when you're in there in the pub and you're hanging out with people and to some extent your own culture and your own ethnicity and your own nationality can become like a kind of baggage because you always stand out you're the odd person out um, so I don't think it's necessarily only sort of second or third generation immigrants who want to shed that baggage of, uh, of, of the home culture. Uh, you know, it can also be, it can also manifest in, in terms of um, rejecting other people. So uh, one thing I felt, again, to be a little anecdotal, but often when I was hanging out with other Indian people in Belfast, I used to feel embarrassed. I mean, because they're so kind of fresh off the boat and they tend to be very communal and you know there was a sense of my wanting to just distance myself from these people and just hang out with the, the, the locals you know and so yeah. I, I think I completely agree with Chorab here that Onikeita and I came back but Onikeita experienced Korea as you know a desire to remove that baggage of the home uh, if you know what I mean so ma'am yeah, would, would like to the baggage you know there is so much of resistance in our minds you're relocating and you say that it's only because of the greenness of the dollar that I am in this country. Otherwise, my heart is always crying out. There's an element of hypocrisy. And so, as you rightly pointed out, if you have relocated, then, of course, you should be open to accept that culture, that sense of accommodation. And that is a rich learning experience, and especially uh, from my uh, various stints and in the USA, what I felt that even among the Asians in uh, the USA, they, like I was in North Carolina, which has a huge black population. The Asians, that is specifically the Bengalis, even from Bangladesh, not only from West Bengal, shunned the black Americans. Yes, and they would be very happy to be with the white Americans. So you think these are very, uh, these are complicated categorizations and this sort of a resistance that the Asians feel superior to the black Americans. But the black Americans feel much more superior to the Asians because they are the Americans. You understand? So I will give you an, do we have time? Two yes, minutes. Please, please. So, in, in our at our in, university in Calcutta University, there were uh, a few uh, visitors, Black American uh, young scientists uh, that were they were into research. They were very young people, I think, in their twenties. And so, uh, first of all, when uh, I was asked to show them Calcutta around a little, because that you asked to asked to help them in the lab because they were scientists. So when I took them out, uh, when I at the Victoria Memorial and, um, and the Indian Museum, etc., people started clicking photos of them and they found them so, so bizarre as if they were out uh, from uh, outer space because they were black, they were tall, they had these uh, braided locks and so they were really two young girls. Why I'm saying this is that when I took them to the South uh, City Mall, what happened? Nobody was even bothering to look at them. Then suddenly two tall, very well-built, attractive black young men came up. They were footballers. You know the footballers are hired yes, for yes, various teams? 
they mm. came to speak to them seeing these two black girls and when they heard that these two guys were from nigeria they would not talk to him to talk to either of them and then when they went away they said we have nothing to do with these africans can you believe it african can you african. believe it yes in terms of, so you you know it's one hour we cannot really explore and and all these networks of uh, categorization where race color class religion all these matter the intersections that is and these intersections determine who we are and we have to be always conscious in our studies nowadays in terms of research that we have have to address what the intersections mean to us because as you know cultural studies and intersectionality have become very much uh, enmeshed in our understanding of a literary text yes thank you ma'am thank you so Thank any other you. questions? Anyone else? Um, if not, then Anjali, would you like to make any? Genia is uh, Genia. Genia is just ma'am. Just one last. Genia, she's a research scholar. She's saying that uh, she she probably cannot uh, hear. I mean, uh, speak to us. Even if hmm. one has accepted and adapted the culture of the host country, hmm. what happens when the host country still refuses to incorporate you into their space? I mean, the other way around. The host country is not letting you in the space. I mean, that is also a kind of a feeling that an immigrant might feel that the host country would not let a refugee or a, sorry, a, an immigrant into their space. That is what she asks. So that is also yes, uh, that is very common. You see, you will and Prague will know about this also. There are little clusters, Indian cluster, Pakistani cl cluster, Bangladeshi cluster. chinese clusters which is you know any minority group which is what right the diaspora community are called uh, resident aliens you are resident and yet you are an outsider yes so that is something that is so common and uh, to be absolutely getting immersed into that culture probably doesn't happen we try very hard intellectually but culturally i suppose that bit of resistance especially in terms of our skin color when we stand out so so vividly in any uh, location is very common say a european in america will not be uh, will not be identified the way i or one of you will be identified as an outsider yes so these are issues which have to which are being negotiated and of course people have accepted that people from other parts of the world will be here like nowadays in all these it sectors in india there are lot of koreans who are working koreans are not like us and the koreans are also into making little clusters what about our muslims yes why they feel a sense of security because they live in clusters all minority communities uh, believe in this sort of a feeling a sense of belonging in their if, I, if i may here ma'am i have an observation which i have an observation here ma'am do you agree with me I, i'd like to ask i think i think bengalis are perhaps peculiar in you know amongst other cultures in our a uh, desire to be cosmopolitan and a desire to avoid this kind of cluster i mean amader modhe at least i i strongly felt this even uh, amongst other uh, you know indians abroad unno a uh, state is lokera and uh, you know they often again i'm you know, sweeping statements and generalizations and i may be wrong uh, but you know even other countries the chinese there's there are strong centripetal tendencies they they tend to sort of cohere and and collectivize and and be comfortable amongst their own but amongst the bengali and perhaps this is the legacy of colonialism there is a kind of uh, a, i don't know a kind of default uprootedness and also a, a desire to be cosmopolitan and a desire to sort of 
you know, not stick to your own community to, to that extent. Would you agree, ma'am? Yes, I will agree completely because especially the Bengalis that you have met are all very high skilled Bengalis. Yes, actually, yeah. in terms of being uh, teachers, lawyers, doctors, you know, whole, uh, and so their position of power and distinction uh, makes them uh, makes them accepted and they also try to be accepted and they do not think that i uh, need to be uh, i uh, my uh, sense of communitarian uh, uh, impulse i can feel more secure than absolutely trying to uh, uh, retain my own ethnic identity in a place where I will remain a minority otherwise. Exactly. Right. And like in England, you must have seen that area in, uh, uh, in, uh, in London, which is, okay. it's called South Hall. Yeah. South Hall, yeah. you South find, Hall. yes, it has dhabas all over. Yes, I had some and, of the best Indian food abroad, by the yeah. way. <laughs> ethnic and they're so and you know if by chance somebody marries a white person oh my god he's married a gora fine you know so let us not go into all that but these are the complexities yes but you cannot say that there is a general unification of all the concepts that we intellectually think in terms of transnationalism about transculture but to find that operating in every household would be a very different set of studies literature can transcend and literature can deconstruct and literature has both resilience and resistance but if you look at the studies and surveys with the social scientists would do you would find that the aim is to be there because it is a land of opportunity and mm. to feel absolutely uh, secure that if i can work for 20 years here i can return home with more money and mm. have that dream house but that really um, do you also think, and uh, just one more thing, uh, Medha, who's a, a fellow faculty member, yes, has a question. But is, yes. if, I, if I may, mm. just one last addition to this. To, to what extent do you think this desire for this, uh, you know, uh, this dream country, is that not also inflected by colonialism, by our sense of being inferior and our yes. sense of there being a master culture, uh, the, the white person and, you know, the white person's yes, country in the West? Yeah. 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 With 250 years of British rule and the sort of leadership we had since then, we are following the British model whenever it is convenient for us, even in terms of the Homosexual Act. Yes, so whenever, uh, so in terms of that hegemonic control, it is not only about political control, it is totally about cultural colonization. And as Prayag rightly pointed out, the Bengalis are the most culturally yes. colonized. And we're quite uh, sort of a little probably proud of having that hangover even now. But we are not expected to confess that. Yes, because we have learned about post-colonialism. But uh, strangely, again, post-colonial critics who operate from this part of the world have all their children studying and settling in those countries. <laughs> so, you know, the contradictions are too many. Too many. Medha, uh, Medha you have a question, right? Yes, uh, I'm just one last question. This is what happens when we are in uh, conversation with I've you. I've unmuted you, Medha. Uh, can Medha. you... Yeah. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. 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 Uh, good yes, afternoon, yes. ma'am. Yes. Um, ma'am, I would like to draw your attention to the situation in Palestine. Mm. And um, the, the Palestinian and Israeli conflict, in which began in, in 1947, 1948, uh, was, was in many ways rendered more acutely difficult by the UN partition plan. And uh, at the end of the war, again, in late 1948, you have the UN General Assembly sort of passing uh, a resolution uh, which emphasized on uh, the right to return, that refugees wishing to return to their homeland would then sort of do so and live in peace with their neighbors. 
Mm-hmm. But uh, we know how difficult, and this is something that you had mentioned, that how difficult the process of return is, and it is sort of rendered complex in many ways, um, and induces potentially induces a different kind of trauma as opposed to the trauma of displacement. So, to what extent? My question is: To what extent do you think this international cooperation is uh, a reality? Because it what appears to me is that it is more of an eye wash. Do you really think that we have this environment of international cooperation which would facilitate the return of a refugee to his homeland? Do you see? Uh, I personally, I'm not of a political analyst, uh, but for me, what I have, uh, having lived through many decades, I have sort of understood that it is the dominance of particular nations which direct the not only the flow of people but also the flow of capital monetary capital and that again is based on the most effective uh, profiting tool in capitalism unfortunately is still military weapons yes so you yeah. have to keep these conflicts alive it cannot be vasudhaiva kutumbakum yes <laughs> that the world is one family because unless conflict is alive you know capitalism thrives on conflict right. yes and right. so and that capitalism is thriving on conflict not in terms of a collective but mm-hmm. even among individuals yes huh. so huh. if you have uh, if you have a Honda and I have a Nano, I have to feel as if I'm absolutely diminutive. Uh, the size of the Nano because I have a Nano. Yes. Hmm. So this has been implanted into the individual psyche as well as the collective psyche of the people of the world culturally, socially, politically, and also from the economic standpoint. And right. this is why these wars, unless we can invent something which will be far more lucrative than war weapons, only then wars will end. Yes. And see, the theater of war has cha- has shifted into the third world. Yes. But the manufacturer of all these war weapons are the first world countries mostly. Yes. Who are the, uh, who are the purchasers? who are importing these you know the largest purchaser of war weapons is is what? saudi arabia and india they are always at war with each other who is going to get it for what reason then you have to keep something alive for us right. of course the easiest is pakistan because china is too hot to handle and so <laughs> yeah and for them it is the israeli palestine in among the COVID-19 problems, you notice that they wanted to advance towards the West Bank and occupy a section of the Palestinian uh, land. Yeah. So yeah. in terms of politics, politics without profit doesn't work. Yes. Right. Unfortunately, this is a reality which once upon a time we were very idealistic. We thought that, well, the changing of the world is what one dreamt of, but it is so deeply in, enmeshed in profit that mm. without that politics, a long-standing politics does not help. Right. Thank Even you. as you uh, heard our finance minister in the afternoon. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. You really um, uh, set me free from the Rana God. <laughs> <laughs> so no, actually, ma'am, when it comes to a conversation with you, it is usually, I mean, it never ends because of the small anecdotes and the way you tell us things. Uh, we always look forward to those. But may I say thank you on behalf of the entire department and PhD uh, scholars and the uh, 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 postgraduate students who took time uh, amidst all these 
things you're doing. I know you keep busy, or not only in Randapar, but you're writing a lot. You're uh, editing. You're, you're you're reviewing. You're doing so many things. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And thank uh, you so much. We have faculty members. Thank you, Prag. Thank you, Prag. Thank you, thank you ma'am. Yes. Thank, you so <laughs> thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I'll end the meeting then, uh, and see you soon, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.